Assalamu alaikum everyone. I am so excited right now because, uh, gosh, I have got the most amazing woman right next to me here uh, on the latest episode of Modesty Table, which of course is powered by World Hijab Day, um, which is a not-for-profit organization. And of course, you know by now that we are a massive sort of global initiative uh, to raise awareness about hijab and Muslim women and our experiences, our voices and our stories. And this lady next to me, amazing, amazing, amazing. It's Jamie, not Jamie. Um, so cool. without further ado. <laughs> it's, it's Jamie? It's Jay. <laughs> I'm going to let you take over, right? I'm going to give it to you. Uh, so please uh, introduce yourself a little bit to our listeners and viewers. Guys, I know you guys are going to enjoy this. So without further ado, the lovely, lovely lady. Thank you so much. So as mentioned, my name is Jamie. Um, my name is Jamie Brown, and I am an American. And I also do a lot of artwork. I do murals internationally and street art and installations and all kinds of things. And I pretty much just spend my time being creative and, you know, trying to take things easy and, you know, be a good influence as much as possible and be inspirational as much as possible. And, you know, just try to keep a positive attitude all the time, which is generally true so I'm very happy to be here and I wanted to say thank you so much for having me on oh bless you I'll be honest with you as soon as I've spoken to you and even the voice messages that you've left me full of energy positive you just it's just infectiously like I want to smile constantly you know so yeah, I think you're I think you're absolutely awesome. I love, um, you know, I love, I think now that I'm a little bit older, I am getting back into art and, you know, that appreciation for doing something different and creative. So when I came across your profile and your little, your video interview um, on Islam channel, I just thought, oh my God, I have to speak to this amazing lady and get you on uh, Modesty Table. So I'm so excited to be speaking to you. Tell us about art and where did it start for you and why and how? And I mean, I've seen you on the side of buildings. I've seen you do amazing stuff on the pavements as well. Tell us, how did it all start for you? Well, I mean, it really started when I was a, a young girl. I didn't really care for watching TV so much. And my mother was an artist and I mean, she still is. And, you know, she always thought it was way more fun for me to just take a box of art supplies and she would set me up at the kitchen table with, you know, everything you could think of. And I would just be there for hours, you know, just making things and just always wanting to create. And, you know, I took ceramics classes. I took everything when I was a kid and I was really into art always my whole life. And then I, I went away to university to study business that I had no interest in studying. And what I really wanted to do was do hair. So I became a hairstylist and not at all what I thought was going to happen. And then I said, you know, I'm from a city called Kenosha, Wisconsin. You probably heard about it in the news this past summer. There was a lot of things happening with, you know, just a lot of unrest here. But it's a very peaceful, happy city besides last time. And I liked it here, but I knew that I wanted to do something bigger. And I've never been really scared to take a chance. Uh, my my life theme is kind of like this. I'd rather just close my eyes and jump in the deep end than stand in the shallow end, ankle deep, wondering, what if? What would have happened? Like, I'll take my chance and we'll find out what happens. So uh, I just packed everything I owned into my car and I said, see you guys later. I'm going to move to Hollywood. So that's what I did. And I moved to California by myself. Did not have a plan, did not have a job, did not have anything. I just showed up like, hey, we'll figure it out. And I figured it out. And from there, I started doing hair. This is this is part of this whole artistic journey. So I started doing hair and makeup for like commercials and music videos and things. And I quickly realized that in the production office was where the money was. And I said, well, why am I doing hair? I'd rather be doing that. I'll make five times more money. So I kind of like switched and slowly inserted myself into that realm of production. And once I started doing that, my schedule was a lot more flexible. So when I was living in LA, I started painting again. And it had been a few years 
And I guess I just took inspiration from just being so happy. I mean, when you live in LA, it's impossible to be sad. It's blue skies, sunshine, palm trees. Like, how can you be mad? That's why everybody moves to LA because it's like so happy there. So I just, I started painting again and I was taking commissions. And then pretty soon it was like, oh, wow, I'm back in the swing of things. Well, around that time, I was trying to convince a colleague of mine. Um, we were working on this TV show and he had to leave on a Friday. And I was like, you're going to the mosque. It's like one o'clock on a Friday. That doesn't make sense. And he's like, oh, makes perfect sense. That's what we do. And I was like, what? I was, okay, come to church with me on Sunday. And then, you know, a long story later, this is a whole nother topic. I ended up deciding that, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to become Muslim. My, my whole trick to convert him to Christianity completely backfired. And I'm converting myself back to Islam. <laughs> so I said, I got to get out of here. I need to get away from this crazy, ridiculous lifestyle that I have. I can't be like reading the Quran during the day. And then at night, I'm like, going out like, no, that doesn't make sense. So I said, I know that if I stay here, for sure, the, the people around me are going to change me in a way that I don't want to be changed. So I need to change the people around me. Let me go and do my own thing. So I decided to make Hezra by myself. And I just to the obvious choice, just pack one suitcase and move to Morocco. So wow. I, I, yeah. So I moved to Morocco, and my goal was to help the underprivileged children, and you know, work with some of the poorer communities, and kind of like provide art services. Nobody wanted it, <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I just decided to kind of wander around, and I was living in Agadir, Morocco, and they have this big. Um, it's kind of like a site for artisans where they have their studios and they all practice there. And so I wandered around one day and there was a painter working and he said, yeah, I have this studio. I have all these paints. It's so quiet around here. Nobody ever comes through here. Like anytime you want to paint, marhaba, come, come paint, whatever you want. He said, in the meantime, here's some canvases. And he gave me a few small canvases and he said, here's four of them. Take them. If you're interested, paint them or whatever. And so I was like, I don't even know where I can find paint around here. So I found this tiny little art store that was selling American brands of like paint things for, you know, 10 times the price that they are. And I managed to just get a small collection of paints going and I started painting again when I was in Morocco. So now we've transferred it from my hometown to LA, now to Africa. And I did, I did a couple murals while I was there and uh, just like private ones, not on a building or anything, not like a huge high rise or something. Um, and then I just started doing art again and I was really, really into it. But the problem is the Moroccan community where I lived was not really into it. And I'm not saying this about all Moroccans. I'm just saying in my specific neighborhood, there wasn't a big appreciation for art. You see a lot of the like orange ombre sunsets with like a black silhouette of a camel in front of it. And it was pretty much a lot of that style art. So what I was doing, they were not interested in. They was like, what, what is this? It's abstract, doesn't even make sense. I'm like, okay. So I ended up coming back to the States, which was supposed to be a temporary thing. I was in Morocco for about five years. And then when I came back to the States, I started painting again while I was here. And then it felt right again. And so I kept doing that and I was loving it and loving it and loving it. And, you know, life happened, things happened. It, I got pulled away from it and then I got pulled back to it again at the end of 2018. And then ever since then, I've just been on this like track to try to complete as many murals, as many projects, installations, everything that I can do um, because I love it. And I've had enough time of doing things that I don't love. So I said, why don't I just do this all the time? And here we are. I mean, amazing. It's, you know, to see the art as well. It's so interesting that you've been, you've, you've almost traveled through quite a little bit there, you know, and um, you've gone to Morocco, you've, you've kept the artist, you know, the, the, the creative flow going, but you've come back and then you've almost smashed it quite big. You've gone pretty, uh, you know, the social media is amazing for this type of stuff, you know, connecting to the rest of the world. And I think so many people have um, connected to you through your art. Would you agree? You've had such an amazing response. Um, do you think being a Muslim woman 
as a hijab wearing Muslim woman, where does that come into this journey? For me, I'm not affected by it at all. To me, this is just fabric. I don't notice it. I don't feel it. I'm so used to it. And I mean, I've been wearing hijab for over a decade. So for me, I don't, I don't notice it to me. It's, I don't even, I don't even really see it. And to some other people that might be watching me do work, I think they're slightly confused and partially intrigued because they see a girl doing street art and they're like, wait a minute. Ooh, what is this? Is this to protect her from the sun? Is it like a shade blocker or like, or a, you know, a sun protector or what? Like, well, she can't be Muslim. Look at her. She's white. You know, it doesn't make sense. She doesn't speak with an accent. She doesn't have, you know, Middle Eastern features, like all these incorrect assumptions. And, you know, a lot of my art in my murals, ha actually almost all of them have Native American symbolism. So they don't know what to think a lot of the times, you know, but it's, it's definitely a conversation opener. And there's a lot of people that, you know, have passed by and especially... I did one in a smaller town um, this past summer and the response from the community was wonderful. It's so wonderful, so much so that I actually ended up changing the name of the mural to kind of like honor the people of the community, just the way that they were just so kind and gentle and, and everything. So for me, I know that as a hijabi, we are constantly under a microscope anyways, no matter what we're doing, people are watching us, especially in the West, you know, I know that if I go to a grocery store, people are watching my every move, calculating what I'm doing because they don't know what I am, what I represent, why is this here, what is all this, like, you know, so we're constantly being scrutinized, which I think is a good thing because then that really enforces the entire concept of hijab. It's not just that you can't see what color my hair is. It's the fact that I need to carry myself in a certain way and it's not just about a scarf or not a scarf. And when you know that you're being watched, it's kind of like, you know, when your boss comes to work, when your boss is there, you're gonna be on your best behavior, right? Well, the same thing when you know you're being watched by the entire community. I need to be on my best behavior and I need to represent Islam in a way that they're not used to because they see it on TV. They see all the, the memes, the social media jokes and da da da. They don't generally have access to Muslims. I'm talking about Americans from my experience. You know, and even if let, let's say their neighbors are Muslim, they stick to their own groups. They don't they don't intermix with the I'm Muslim. My neighbors are Muslim. They don't even talk to me. And I'm like, what? why? Like, so alaikum. there's Ajr in that smile at me. Say something, you know? No. So, you know, I feel like we have to be on our extra, extra good behavior because everyone is watching us, which we kind of hold our own selves more accountable that way because then you really have to make sure that you're not just wearing the scarf, but you're also carrying yourself and behaving in a way that is aligned with what the scarf represents. I mean, absolutely correct there. And I think before we came on live, we mentioned about, um, you know, this wearing the hijab, it's almost like representation. It's almost like we're ambassadors, just like we have, um, you know, our amazing ambassadors for World Hijab Day. As Muslim women, when we choose to wear hijab, it's like without us actually speaking, this hijab, this uh, piece of cloth represents our faith. So it is, it's like you said, it's a conversation starter, isn't it? Um, you know, and uh, we, we, we try our best. And I think it's amazing to, you know, even just we're so different and this is this is what you know you bring to the table almost to the modesty table this conversation with art and um the fact that you're doing something amazing we we love to see that and we hope that the people who are listening in uh and watching can connect with you and if they have any questions about art they can sort of get in contact with you because <laughs> I mean, how, how does art, you know, impact you? Like, what, what do you, you know, what would you do if you didn't have art? Because this, is this like... Um... Curl up and die. That's what I would do. <laughs> right. I mean, we, so... we can't live without it. We really can't. If you think about it, look at what happened during lockdown. What did everybody do? They stayed in their house and they did what? We got they crazy. Went, they went crazy. They developed new habits. They maybe picked up a hobby. 
a lot of people sat around and watched Netflix all day. Okay, well, Netflix is art. Those shows are art. Those set designers that create these magical wonderlands and all these movies, well, guess what? Those are all <laughs> art majors. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, everywhere you go, there's art, you know? And even in your house, what color is your couch? What color is your whatever you know I mean it's like you have your style you even your decoration in the way that you live your in your home right down to what color bath towels you pick for your bathroom there's art everywhere it's always just kind of sliding through in hidden places where maybe it's more noticeable in some and like in those hidden places you're like oh wait a second well that's pretty cool so I feel like it's a complete part of my life and it's therapeutic too and people for say sure. all the time, they're like, you're so happy, you're so happy. And I'm like, well, first of all, Islam. Second of all, art. And I have a studio in my basement. So I always joke, like, I've been in Corona mode for the last five years. Like, welcome, everyone. Like, I love it. Stay in the house, paint in my studio all day and not deal with the public. It's a win-win for me. So I don't mind it at all. I think that, you know, when you have art, whether you're doing it, like, in, you know, the way I do it, or whether it's somebody that's maybe took an art class in high school that is just bored and wants to try something new, do it. Go, go to the art store, go get a canvas, go get paintbrushes, go get paint, do it. And if you do it and it's terrible, so what? Do it again and keep doing it until it's not terrible. And that might take your whole life. And maybe when you die, it'll still be terrible, but somebody's gonna like it and somebody's gonna appreciate it and somebody's gonna be inspired by it. So you just do what you do and enjoy the process. And a lot of people say, oh, it's all about the process. I've, in my stubborn ways, I've, I've really learned that, yeah, it is about the process because I enjoy what I'm doing when I'm doing it. And at the end result, there's a gift, a canvas, let's say, then great. But the time that I spent like decompressing and just, you know, letting everything out and just flowing across a canvas, there's something so calming about taking a very watery mix of acrylic paint and a sponge brush and just watching it dance across the canvas. It just kind of brings like the sense of peace to you. So I think for me personally, it's definitely necessary to survive. Maybe not for everyone, but I highly encourage everyone to make it like that. Like go get some art, try it. For sure. I mean, look, as a mom, uh, I can say definitely art has saved my life because without those crayons, without those paints, without those, you know, like what would the kids have done? <laughs> you know, so I think it's 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 so important. And you're right. I think we went through a phase, um, especially here in the UK, where um, all of a sudden these arty uh, creative books were coming out for adults. So it was, like you said, therapy, art therapy. And the we mandala coloring. books and the mandala, however you say it, like we, the yeah, coloring. The, the patterns and the, you know, just focusing. And um, I bought a book and it was mindful art. So it'd have a quote and really intrinsic, like delicate patterns. Oh. So, I mean, art, art is, it, it's wonderful. And I think for me, when I was growing up, it was sketching. I did this wonderful sketch and I, I like to brag about it because that scored me a 96% on my art exam. And um, yeah, you know, even me, I've got a bit of creativity as well. So Everyone I think, does. yeah, you're so right. Whatever form it takes, whether it's uh, spoken word poetry, whether it's painting, whether it's uh, sketching, whether it's, you know, like you said, um, interior design, there's so much around us. Um, and we can take so much beauty from the surroundings that we can, if we can put that onto paper, if we can put it on a canvas, it's, it's or super or a wall. This brings me on to, I mean, I've had a look at some of the stuff that you've done. It's absolutely, it's, it's so vibrant. It's so colorful. I'm just like in awe. And I think this is just so your personality. It's so you that it's, it's very authentic. Um, and I think is is that part of the enjoyment of you, you know, because you're creating this and, you know, it's like you said, that ah moment once you've done it. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think my art is reflective of my personality um, kind of in the way that my my signature move that I love to do is I love to put colors together that have no business being next to each other. Colors that don't match when they don't match it's a contrast and it's a contradiction and it's kind of like it's making you uncomfortable and you don't know why but you still like it and I feel like that's me I'm a good it looks so good all together honestly it's 
it's amazing. I can see what you're saying with the contrasting colors, but I think this is what I love about you. You've got so much going on within your personalities. You've got so much personalities within your personality, within the, the, the murals that you've done, the walls, and you can see how this could definitely, it's uplifting to see, I'll be honest with you. So I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I check out so much more. I'm going to literally Instagram stalk you <laughs> and, yeah, uh, well just, and enjoy all the art that you've done. Um, I mean, it's crazy. I was going to ask you, what's the, what's your favorite art piece or art thing that you've done? What's your favorite? Uh, this one's hard to talk about and not get emotional. Um, I did a huge piece in Milwaukee and it was, it was, a, it was a tough one. I, I tried so many times. I kept doing design after design after design and I just, I hated every one of them. And there's another artist that I work with and he said, go back to your roots, go back to your roots. Think about, think about what makes you, you. And so I just felt super inspired. Like, I don't know why it makes me so emotional. I felt super inspired and I applied for this mural and I just said, I got to have this. I have to do this one. I have to win this. I, I cannot not win this. And I poured my heart into the design and it was like right when the whole like lockdown was going on and they were doing interviews and I had to do like a Zoom interview with 18 people on this like committee of this architecture committee, the downtown Milwaukee committee, all just so many people that were involved in this process that had to give approvals. And so I had to interview with them and kind of, I guess, sell my idea of why I thought my proposal should be chosen. And I completely nailed the entire interview and they chose me on an 18 to zero unanimous vote. And I think that really just gave me this, this new perspective, I think, you know, and, and another reason why I really like that one, because it's a, it's a skywalk that goes, it connects a historical building to an old mall that's now an office space. And it's this over the sky or like over the street, like, you know, skywalk building. And there's pillars underneath it for support. And generally when you have some kind of structure, it's uniform on each side. Well, this one had an odd number, which is not typical for architecture of that nature. And it had five pillars. And I just was like, I gotta have it, I gotta have it. There's five pillars, it's meant to be. And so apparently it was meant to be and I won the bid and I got it and I spent a the good month working on it and, um, it was just, it was an incredible experience because there it's the side of the building and then it's underneath the building as well. I, I asked them after, I said, well, what are we gonna do with this? Can I just paint that too? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we were gonna ask you to do it. So I painted the whole like underneath part and then it comes up a little bit on the back and then I also painted the pillars. So it, when you walk or drive through it, it's an absolutely immersive experience because you're literally like tunneling through the colors. And like you said, it's just, a lot of vibrancy. And you know, the thing is that in the building underneath the door, um, I learned when we were up there painting that it's actually a dialysis center. So you have a lot of elderly people that are coming in for their dialysis appointments that we would see two, three times a week, you know, and once they're done, they get really cold. So, and this, we were doing this in the summertime and it was super hot and they'd come out with a winter coat and I'd be like, are you okay? Like they'd be, you know, they push them out in the wheelchair so that they can like wait for their like ride or transportation or whatever um, outside. And I said, SubhanAllah, look it. They come out here, they're waiting for their ride. Everything is just like cement buildings and gray and this and that. There's really not much for them to be looking at. And I said, now look, not only, I mean, it's fine if the mural's on the one side, but that doesn't affect them when they're standing underneath it. Now that they're underneath it and they can see all this color, they can see all the colors on the pillars, you know, coming out of a three hour appointment like that, the color is enough to cheer you up, you know? And also in these, these yucky winters here, you know, it's gray and like dismal and just not, not fun uh, January, February. So when you're coming around the corner and you're having a cruddy day that matches the weather and you look up and you see this giant blast of color in your face, you're like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. And maybe that might bring a smile to your face or improve your mood slightly, you know, something. And if nothing else, even for the people that were in the dialysis clinic, you know, give them something to look at too, you know? 
Wow, what an I mean, what an amazing opportunity, you know. It's it's like we all have something within us to do, you know, to um, you know, uplift people. And I think this is your thing. This is it's amazing to think of it in that way as well. You know, you've done this amazing mural just outside of dialysis, and of course they it's not an easy thing, you know, being um going in for three hour long appointments and wow what what an amazing uh you know thing that you've done there it's uh yeah it's difficult not to get emotional about it so I'm so I'm so happy that you had that chance and you know what I think we need to connect on this because I'd love for you to do something uh you know what I'm passionate about actually is Masjid Al-Aqsa I mentioned to you off air as well that you know it's a place uh, it's it's a blessed land that I've traveled to many times and I think we could do so much more and using art forms, um, and this is actually quite exclusively being announced right now, but um, I'm working on a track with an amazing artist with, you know, it's going to be about Masjid Al-Aqsa. So Ooh. hopefully inshallah, in time for Ramadan, it would be, it would be ready. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you do something artistic with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you, so, are you able to reveal? Sorry? Are you able to reveal this top secret? So it's it's at the moment, the only sneak preview I can say is that there is an amazing track that will be released in Ramadan uh, about Masjid Al-Aqsa. And I'm oh, so, so awesome. excited. So, you know, amazing. Uh, imagine if we could have some art, um, you know, some painting, some sketching. And it, it's actually Aqsa week this week. Um, so people are doing, you know, kids are getting involved with, you know, art competitions and creating little uh, things. So um, I'm going to share that with you later as well. But oh, back to you. <laughs> back to you and your sort of art journey where do you see yourself going with this what what's next what exciting things are happening for you oh I you know it's like I always have several things in the works things that I'm planning um generally speaking I don't I don't ever talk about what I'm working on because the iron is real and not saying for you but you know I find that sometimes when I speak about things that I'm going to work on, I end up not finishing them, whether it's outside sources or my own just lack of desire to finish it. So I don't talk about too many things, but I will say that um, I've started this collection of works that is so opposite because my mural style and my, my regular painting style could not be more opposite. I'm very abstract, fluid, nothing is marked, everything just goes with the flow. And then when you see that in contrast to a mural where everything is meticulously planned out, everything has to be exactly, you know, because you forget that when you're working, you know, you're this close and then you can't see what you're doing. And then you step down, take a, you know, walk a block backwards and then look at it and you're like, oh man, you know, you have to make sure that everything is precise. So it took a while for me to get used to that. Because for me, everything is just la, carefree, flowing, abstract, go with the flow, you know? And then to, to do that and have to plan something, it's like, it's a feeling, it's an emotion. It's not, it's, it's not mathematics, you know? So I have those two contrasting styles. But I've taken that and I have really started focusing on some other paintings that I've been doing way smaller than what I'm used to. I'm trying to step out of my, my kind of like web of creativity. I'm trying to branch out and... I have a little bit of experimental processes with other methods and techniques and mediums. And um, I've been working on these wooden boards. They're 24 by 24 inches. What that is in centimeters, your guess is as good as mine, uh, about <laughs> this big, big enough. But I'm used to huge paintings. So for me, these are tiny. To most people, they're like, no, that's not. It's like the size of like a couch cushion, basically, about that big. And so I've been doing some work on these wood paintings. And I'm really liking it because it's giving me the small scale kind of like freedom that a mural doesn't give you. But I'm also using the bright colors and the shapes and the more methodical way of mapping it out. Um, so I've been kind of liking that a lot. And when I'm painting on the wood, I'm like purposely 
leaving certain shapes not painted so that the natural wood is showing through. It's not treated. It's not glossed. It's not anything. It's just raw wood. So I really like, I've been liking the way that's turning out and I've gotten quite a lot of feedback on that where people are like, Oh, that's cool. I like this new style. So I'm kind of going that way. But then every once in a while I get these urges where I'm just like, yeah, but the fluid motions and then I get, and then I miss that style, you know? So sometimes I'll, I'll just go back in the studio and like, you know, work on a painting or two like that and get it out of my system. And I'm like, okay, now back to, back to where I was at. So it's, it's a lot of playing around, but that's the freedom of, you know, the, essentially that's the essence of being an artist. You're just, you're constantly learning, teaching, creating, improvising, you know, all these things. Some of my tools are super random. Like one of my favorite tools that I use is a kitchen spatula when I'm painting, you know, you just find things when you're in the moment and you're like, okay, I need something to do that can do this. That doesn't exist. Okay. What can I use as a makeshift version of that? And then you start like your brain just starts going like, okay, what can I do? What can I do? And then pretty soon you're, you know, pushing a broom around on a canvas. So, I mean, that's, that's what I say, you know, like the beauty of the process is kind of discovering techniques and discovering also what you like, what you don't like, and also what works and doesn't work. Because sometimes you think your thing is amazing and then people see it and they're like, eh, you know, and you're like, but I'm so proud of it. And they're like, nah. Yeah. So, so it's nice to kind of get like that balance and, you know, just work on a whole different set of skills. So there's, there's always something going on, but right now I'm, it's mainly just the, the wood canvases and, and planning more mural work for 2021 if travel resumes somewhat normally. Well, I mean, it's exciting, isn't it? Trying something new within, you know, something that you're so passionate about, trying something different and uh, seeing how that goes. It's, it's always um, exciting. A question I had was, um, who, where, where do you get your inspirations? What motivates you to keep going like within art or, you know, even just generally in life? What keeps you motivated? Mm. That's an excellent question. I have so many things that motivate me. It's most of it is me proving to myself that I can do something. And then sometimes it's proving to other people. I'm the type of person like, tell me that I can't do it. Oh, now I'm definitely doing it. And anybody that says, oh, you'll never be able to do that. You can't do that. You can watch. And that's, that's a lot of the motivation. I like to prove that you know, go ahead and doubt me all you want, but I'm going to come up with things you didn't even know I had in store. So that's Lovely. a factor. And then also I like, you know, for the purpose of this too, like I like to show the world that like, just because I'm a hijabi, that doesn't mean I'm a weirdo. I'm, I'm the same as I was before I was Muslim. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I'm still a person that has a character, a personality. Like there are so many Muslims that are just hilarious and fun and like these are the sides of us that the media never wants the public to see so I feel like in my own way any interaction that I have with someone a stranger is a chance for me to not only like you know represent the art world and like what I can do creatively but also representing Islam and Muslim women at the same time so you know how women are we're constantly multitasking so this is just another example of that <laughs> For sure. I mean, exactly. This is this is what we want to get across in this uh, show every Friday. Um, you know, it just, it's just a chance to actually celebrate, uh, just like we just had International Women, uh, you know, International Women's Day. Not so uh, it will be last week once this airs. But, you know, it's it's about celebrating Muslim women as well. And, um, you know, amazing uh, that you're so I love that you know attitude that you've got that actually no, nothing holds me back it leads me nicely into this question which you know I tend to ask every episode to all my guests um and it is you know uh one of those ones where um it's, it's a big misconception out there but uh since you wear the hijab are you oppressed ah! no no <laughs> no I love this question because I'm like it's like oppressed by whom? By oh. my non-Muslim father? No, my dad doesn't care if I wear a scarf or not. He's like, well, you got that thing on your head. Aren't you hot? Yeah, dad. It's a hundred mm -hmm. degrees outside. I'm hot, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, Alhamdulillah, both of my parents are very cool. They're very accepting. Like they were cool with everything from the beginning. So Alhamdulillah for that. But it's like, I want to ask people because I'm from a non-Arab family and a non-Muslim family, and I'm the only Muslim in my entire family, 
who exactly is oppressing me? But like you've you've got to have been forced into wearing this, right? Is that not the response? Are you sure you really want to? You know, is this really? You know, what what's the sort of? Have you ever been asked in that way? Like you know, within your friends, family contacts, have they ever been like? But why? Not really. I mean, I kind of explained the wisdom. Now, this is this is a big reason of why I wanted to move. Once I knew that I was going to become Muslim, like I wanted to take my shahada in Morocco. I said, "Get me out of here! I don't want to do this here. I want to just like, let me make my hijra and move on." So I did that. And when I first landed in Morocco, now mind you, I was living in Hollywood at the time, living a very Hollywood esque lifestyle, and I, I mean, I was into like fashionable things and you know I was a hairstylist so I would always do my hair and like fancy schmancy stuff and like dress cute and now it's like my friends the only thing my friends will say like yeah but like you're so much cuter without it and I'm like to who to people I don't care about ah, I don't care what you think you know I I enjoy it and when I first made the move to Morocco when I was in the airplane I was landing from wherever I was. And I went to, I landed in the airport in Morocco. And I remember I walked into the bathroom there and I took a scarf out of my carry-on bag and I wrapped myself up in a very terrible looking hijab. And I've never taken it off since. So I knew that if I was going to start fresh and become a completely different version of me that has, I mean, I felt like a snake that was like molting, like getting rid of its old skin. And like, I knew that I, I knew that I wanted to wear hijab right away. I, I put on hijab before I even took my his shahada. So, I mean, I was in, yeah, I was living in Morocco for about two weeks before I took my shahada. I did it in Casablanca at the Hassan Tani Mosque. And I wasn't quite done reading. I was like, I had, a little bit left of the Quran. And I said, well, listen, I realized that this is a very giant commitment and not a light statement at all. I can't just become Muslim and then decide six months down the road, you know what? I'm not feeling it. I'm going to go back to my old ways. Like, no, it, like I know that the consequences for that are more grave than if you never even knew Islam at all. So I didn't want to take a commitment to something unless I knew for sure that I read the whole thing. Cause what if there's something like a surprise at the end? Oh, PS, guess what? This is going to happen to you because you're a woman. I didn't want any surprises. A plot twist. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, Oh, by the way, did we mention this? Oh, well too bad. You already took your Shahada. So locked in for life, I guess, you know, I didn't want that situation. So I was like, you know what? Let me just spend another two weeks, like finishing this. And once it's complete, like then, then we'll give it a go. So I ended up taking my shahada after that, which, you know, in hindsight, I guess I never really thought about it till right now. But yeah, I started wearing hijab before I even, you know. That's like it's, it's, um, you know, everybody has a different story. Uh, and especially when it comes to hijab, it's so different for every single person. Some people wear it from young, some people, um, you know, connect with it a lot, you know, when they're older. And, you know, when you ask a hijabi, why do you wear it? It's always a different answer. And when somebody's asked about their hijab story, it's always very different. But it's, it's almost like, how do you, you know, with, with hijab, and, you know, when you're telling me what, how you did it, was it very liberating when you you put it yeah. on? Like, yeah. you know, what was it for you that made you wear it before you even took shahada? What was um, what was that pull to start wearing it? Because I wanted to commit myself fully to Islam, and I know I'm sorry. Like, I'm I'm sitting by the window, and like the UPS guy is here. Like, it's probably like, why are you sitting by your window? Don't worry about it. So sorry oh, for the that. The lighting is amazing. <laughs> Let me say, you look lovely. Well, thank you. Um, my studio, the lighting in my studio is a little bit darker. So sometimes on camera, it looks like real like orangey in the back. So I was like, let me make the light nice. Anyways, um, I feel like I I know that there's a lot of women that say, well, the, the scarf doesn't represent your iman. Does it? I mean, how committed to you, or how committed are you to your dean? I mean, I don't knock anyone that doesn't wear it. If someone doesn't want to wear it, that doesn't bother me one bit. It's not my life. I'm not going to be accountable for that. You know, I do know that Allah will ask us, you know, if you're not wearing it, why not? I mean, you saw the commands, you know, the rule, like I, sh I shouldn't say no, the rules. Cause I know I'm going to irritate a lot of people with this. There's a lot of people that are very sensitive about hijab in one way or the other. I'm not that way. 
I am very neutral because I myself very much love wearing hijab. Other people might not want to wear it at all. Okay. That doesn't mean that I'm a better Muslim. You know, maybe somebody is is waiting and has their phone in their hand and that adhan goes off and she's right there 30 seconds later ready to pray. But she doesn't wear hijab, but maybe she puts it on when she prays and does that. I mean, who knows? Maybe she's a better, way better person than me. I don't know. I'm not here to judge. If you want to wear hijab, great. I'm all for it. If you don't want to wear hijab, great. It's your life. You live it. I don't, I don't think badly of anyone that doesn't wear it. And I certainly don't think that someone is any less of a Muslim if they don't wear it because only Allah can see inside the hearts. And I mean, you already know this, but I would encourage people to, to do it because honestly, it's so nice sometimes. Like, yeah, it's hot from time to time, but it's more often convenient than anything. You know, it's, and it doesn't stop you from doing anything. I wear the full thing, the full long sleeve swimsuit. You know, I, and here there's not, there's no Muslims here. So I am a complete freak show every time I go out in public with my swimsuit on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wearing a burkini. Get over it. Move, move along. I'm here. Why? I'm here to pick up my jet ski rental. Now step aside. You know, on the, well, she's getting on a jet ski. You know, it's like, yeah, it's my birthday. Gonna go have fun. Like, what? I can't have fun because you can't see my hair. What sense would that make? So then you see, it's funny, you see people on the lake and they're on boats and they're looking like, you got a hijab on her? Yeah, I do. <laughs> You know, and it's like, who cares? It does. It doesn't stop me from doing anything. It doesn't. It doesn't make any. I mean, I don't know. I feel like everybody has their own journey, and maybe somebody will take it off for a while, and maybe somebody will come back and put it back on. Who knows? None of that is my responsibility. What my responsibility is is to wear it because I feel like it, not because anybody's telling me to. And you never know who you're going to expire because I, one of the days that I was living in Morocco, um. It was myself, my friend Sarah, who's also American, who was living there. Um, my other friend Najla, also American, living there. And then two of my other friends from, I think, Sweden. And we're all reverts. And at the time when I was in Morocco, I wasn't dressed like this. I was dressed in like the full khimar that like goes underneath and like ties in the back. And then it's like a big bat wing piece. It's like that and the skirt, the whole thing. I dress like that all the time, which I miss. But living here, the point is to blend in and go unnoticed. If I dress like that here, every single person in public is stopping to turn around and look at what I have on. So that defeats the purpose. This is a little bit more like blend inable, but when I go to the Middle East, when I travel, I always go back to the Khmer, so I, I love it. Anyways, mm -hmm. so we're all, go ahead, sorry. I said, wow, I mean, because it's, it's, it's such an important point that you raise. You have to be comfortable in what you're wearing, where you're wearing, and it does have an effect for sure. And I think you have to take into consideration your surroundings. Like, I'm living in Kenosha. Yeah, there's not a lot of people in Khemar here. Zero, to be exact. You know, so it's extremely attention drawing, which is the entire antithesis of what the hijab represents anyways. So I try to keep that in mind. When I when I can be in a place that I am able to wear my Khemar comfortably, I mean, I, I do wear it here in the summer, I do. But it's just like, I know that there's there's a lot of looks that come with it. That's fine with me, but like I said, it's easier for me to wear like, you know, regular clothes here and then save that for when I'm in the Middle East. But my girls and I were at this cafe and this was a really special day for us because we were just sitting around having coffee, no big deal, in a in a more like family friendly like restaurant. Like we're not <laughs> sitting in like the, you know, the, the cafes with the chairs on the sidewalk, like not like that. So we're sitting in this place and we see a girl who looks to be about like 17 and she's with her mom and neither one of them are in hijab and they're sitting in, and the girl keeps looking at us and okay, whatever. Um, it, it's a little odd when you have a, a six pack of full on like white girl reverts, all pale skin, blue eyes, not Arab. And we're all wearing like the same shades of like Navy and purple. Yeah, we're, we're probably going to get some looks and like, I get it, you know, but she kept staring at us and I just, she's crying at this point and she's just got tears flowing down her face silently and her mom is not crying at all. So, and I kept looking at her and my heart was just like so softened and I'm like, why is this girl crying so hard? I'm like, I thought, well, maybe there was like, maybe her grandmother passed away or something. I'm like, well, no, because why would mom be completely emotionless? What, what's going on with this girl that she's crying and the mom is just like, 
zoned out. Like what? And I was like, I don't know. I feel like I need to write her a message. And I happen to have my laptop with me. I pull it out of my bag and I, oh, I go into Google Translate and I'm trying to write her a note. I want to slip her a note. But I wanted to like copy the Arabic and like write it in Arabic because I didn't know if she spoke English. So I wanted to write her a note that said, whatever you're crying about, may Allah make it easy for you. Oh, and so I, I wanted to like slide her this note. Like, so listen, you don't have to explain to me what's, your, what's going on. I don't need to know. I just want you to know that you'll be fine, inshallah. So as I'm writing this, I have like the last like two or three words left. And I see her and her mom get up and they're starting to walk like out of the thing. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not done. I'm not done. <laughs> you know, so I was like, hold on, hold on. And she like kind of looks at me and I was like, please, please, please come here. And I said, uh, let's see. And, and, uh, and so I do the thing and I write it to her and I say, I was like, listen, I'm, I'm trying to say something to you. And I'm saying this to her in, in rock and Arabic. And I'm like, I'm sorry, this is the, this is the proper translation. And she looks at it and she bursts into tears and she's like, Oh my God, I was coming up to you guys. And I, we're like, okay. She starts crying her eyes out and she just loses it at the table. She said that she had been struggling with hijab for so long and she desperately wanted to put it on, but she didn't know how her friends would react. And, you know, she seemed to be, like I said, 17 and high school is a tough age. And, you know, when your friends aren't wearing it and they're like, why would you want to do that? You know, I, I get that part. And, you know, she said, I've been thinking about putting on hijab for so long. And then I see you guys. You're not even born Muslim and look at you. You're wearing hijab to the maximum. You know, and two of our friends were in the cup. And she's like, look at you guys. You are just so bravely Muslim. And you're so like confident in yourselves. And look at how you're dressed. And then she's like, and then I start crying because I look at myself. She's like, I'm a born Muslim. I come from a Muslim family. I was raised in a society of Islam. And here I am in jeans and a tank top. And look at how you're dressed. And I said, that doesn't mean we're better than you. We're just at a different entry point on our own journeys, you know? Maybe we kind of swiped onto the freeway with an express pass because we dove into Islam before we decided to commit to it. So you don't know. I said, listen, our stories are not better than yours. They're just different. And I said, give me your phone number. You know, let's let's meet up sometime when you're not crying and it's not me and a group of six people, you know? And so we kept in contact and I, I actually ran into her in the souk about a month later, ironically enough. And she was there with her mother and she was wearing a floor length maxi skirt and long sleeves and a full hijab. And I gave her the biggest hug and I was like, subhanAllah, this is the unspoken dawah that I always reference. You know, dawah is not about telling people, oh, this, you got to believe that. No, no one wants to be sold on your religion. Don't bother. It's the things that you do as an example that have the most impact. And most of the time, it's like I said, silent, unspoken dawah. We weren't doing anything except just existing and having a good time. And she was so taken aback by that, that she actually turned herself around. Not that there was anything wrong with her, but she just fully embraced hijab and said, thank you. Like seeing you guys that day really affected me. So you never know who is watching you. That, you know, it's like everything is like, comes back full circle. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't know who's watching you. You don't know who's going to be, you know, influence or who you're going to have an impact on just by being you. Subhanallah. I'll be honest with you. What an amazing, uh, you know, definitely a little emotional story there because I think everyone could sort of relate to that a little bit. We all look for, um, you know, something to look up to. And you guys just happen to be there. And Allah made that situation happen. And you were meant to sort of meet. And this this young girl who was struggling, you were almost like answered prayers for her. You know, big sisters, almost something that she saw. And um, wow, what a, what a special story that is. And... I think it's it's just um, it's interesting because a lot of people have different viewpoints about Islam and we've all come in. And I feel, you know, even when you're a born Muslim, I can understand what she was saying, because when you're a born Muslim, it might it, it, there's still a journey to Islam. There's still sort of like a hijra you have to make to Islam because you're born into definitely a culture perhaps not the spiritual side of things because you're just assumed Muslim, um, you know, from the start, but wow. It's it's hard. When you, you know, when you're living in a society that everyone around you wears hijab, it might not be as valuable because when it's in your face all the time, 
eh, like the people in California. When I first moved there, I could not stop talking about the palm trees. And they're like, would you get over the trees? It's palm trees, <laughs> so what? I'm like, yeah, but you guys don't get it. This is so cool. <laughs> you know. And I feel like that's how sometimes as reverts, we just jump into Islam. We know nothing about it. We have no familial, like family style influences. We have no culture. Like what's Islamic culture in America? Okay, it just doesn't exist. There, what, what is our, they don't even recognize Ramadan on the calendar here. So to say that there's a culture, yeah, right, no. So, you know, sometimes when you live in these, and, and, and each country has its own, obviously, pros and cons. But a lot of times, as reverts, we don't have anything to compare Islam to. So we have like a more unadulterated form of Islam. Because I don't take consideration what my uncle told me, or what I grew up doing in school, or what the guy at the Hanut tells me. No, I have none of those people in my ear. I have the Quran. I have the hadith, I have my lectures, I have the scholars, I have everything that I've taught myself over the last, you know, 10 years. And I don't let the interference of culture come in. So I think as reverts, we kind of like, we look at things almost like through eyes of a child, because everything is new. Everything is like uncharted territory, like, wow, look at these mm -hmm. ladies. How do they pray? How do they all know when to do this at the same time? How do they all go down at the same time? Like, how do they know, you know? like all these things were just like we're just like in this state of wonder towards the dean and i feel like you know as as reverts that it dips high and low sometimes like we're just like everyone else but i feel like we we look at things in a different perspective and maybe it's easier for us in some ways and maybe it's hard like for me it, it was easy to put hijab on this is why i wanted to make hijab i said i can't live here because these people are not going to accept what i'm doing they're going to say oh you're a wannabe you're what do you like what do you have an arab boyfriend like no i just want to wear hijab so i had to remove myself from my situation i stayed in morocco for two years unapologetically muslim wearing the hijab the whole thing by the time i came back to america two years later to visit everyone was asking me well, you're not in Morocco anymore. Why don't you just take it off? You're home now. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you think that my hijab depends on my zip code? Because no, my dean is with me all the time and Allah can see me everywhere. It's not like I snuck past him and got on the plane and Allah doesn't see that. He knows, you know? So I would say like, no, I, I like it. I want to wear it here. And they would say, yeah, but you don't have to. Just take it off. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> Who, I'm sorry, is there somebody with a clipboard checking me off every day? No, Allah sees me, that's it, you know? And so for me, I had to like, you know, pull myself away so that when I came back, like they knew I was already two years deep in hijab. You ain't gonna pull this off of me, no way, not happening. Like there's nothing you can say to convince me not to wear it. So don't even try. And I think they learned that right away. But when you grew up in a Muslim family and then maybe you're 19 and you decide to put your hijab on, and your mom and your brothers and your cousins are like, why? You're not married. You're never going to get married like that. What's the point? You know, sometimes it's harder, you know, and I feel like as, as reverts, you're on one side of the coin or the other, either you have a really easy transition or you have a lifetime of difficulties. And Alhamdulillah for me, it's been an insanely easy transition. And I have nothing but support from my friends and family and like everybody's cool. Like my mom, especially, you know, when Ramadan comes, she'll come to my house and she'll be like, okay, I brought you a basket. Uh, we have some dates in here. What are these, these Mahmoul cookies? I saw these in the, in the Middle Eastern section at the grocery store. I try these. And, you know, she brings me like, you know, fruit and, you know, all those things. And cause she knows, you know, a lot of times when you're here, you don't feel Ramadan, especially me. Like as soon as I leave my house, where is Ramadan? There's nowhere. I don't even, there's not even a mosque in my city. You know, there's an Islamic center, but it's not a mosque. And, you know, it's like, to have parents that are this supportive, honestly, like it makes things so much easier. But I do recognize that there's a lot of girls, Muslim or not, that maybe hijab is extremely difficult. And rather than judge those girls, all I do is just make the offer them and say, okay, Allah, make it easy for them. Make their journey easy. If, you know, put it in their hearts. If they're, if they're meant to wear it, then put it in their hearts, make them want to wear it and not care what anybody says. You know, I say this all the time. I'm unapologetically Muslim. I'm not going to pretend, I'm not going to like, oh, let me just, tuck this in and make it look like a hoodie. No, hijab, people, hijab. Enjoy it, you know, like it's just, 
I yeah. love that. You know, it's it's such a powerful statement um, to make as well. And I think perhaps sometimes we forget this. It's like you said, you get used to something and perhaps it's not that you lose the value for it, but you don't appreciate that because it, it, it's the same thing, isn't it? In Medina and Mecca, they get so used to having that amazing thing right there. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy. But I, you know what? I think I've... Um, You've made me appreciate hijab even more to a next level. It is really about being unapologetic, unapologetically Muslim, powerful, strong, independent, and it is liberating. I'm glad we had this conversation because this is this is how passionate you are about hijab. And you know, maybe the people that are listening have had it difficult or are thinking about it. Um, we're already coming up to the end of the hour. I can't believe it. I think we need a part two uh, okay. for Jamie. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to do a part two at some point for sure. But if you could just leave us with, you know, what you would like to say to the to the to the women out there, to the Muslim women out there, to the young girls out there, um, you know what? What would you like to say to them? If if you're not in a place to wear hijab right now, and you want to make du'a, make sincere du'a, du'a that you will find a way to get in there and make it happen, and. YOLO, put it on. Who cares? Who cares? What what are you gonna what are you afraid of? Judgment from your neighbor? Is your neighbor gonna be there on judgment day? No. You're answering to Allah. If you think that it would make Allah pleased with you, then do it. If you're not ready, then make to all that you will be ready at some point. And you know, to the other women that do wear it, stop shaming the women who don't. They are not any less Muslim than you. They're in a different place. And if you see your sister struggling and you would like her to wear hijab because you feel that that would benefit her because that's your own belief, then by all means make to offer her. But do not backbite her. Do not talk down to her. And do not make her feel that she is less of a Muslim than you because you wear a scarf and she doesn't. Because her character might be a thousand times better than yours and you don't know it. You know? You might not make it to Jenna. And her with all her hair showing, maybe she does. You don't know. So until, until she gets to that point, or if she never does, maybe she doesn't want to wear hijab. Okay. It's not your responsibility. That's the number one thing. I see so much hate in the community towards other hijabis. Oh, look at you. Look at your wrist yeah. is showing. Yeah, her wrist is showing, but is her hair showing? Is she wearing a bikini and bouncing around on TikTok? No. So you saw her wrist. Okay, there's worse crimes in humanity. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, say to her, oh, sweetheart, sister, I don't know if you know, but you're not really supposed to show your wrist or you're not supposed to have your short sleeve t-shirt on. And Whatever you need to say. Do it with kindness. Her, is it with kindness and is it necessary? Will she benefit from that or will she be offended? And are you going to push her further away from hijab? Because That's you should be going to be showing her loving kindness, not this authoritarian, or like this totalitarian, ah, oh, you're going to <laughs> not everybody can wear it. And you know what? That's okay. Because that's not your responsibility, you know? Just just try it. And, and and you can evolve. Baby steps. Start, you know, if you're more comfortable with the turban. Okay, start with the turban. And then go down to the thing with the neck showing. And then close the neck. And then try this other stuff. Do it at your own pace. Ask Allah to help you. And if there's women in the community that don't have any interest in wearing it, so what? It's not your business. So yes, focus on themselves. I think it's such a powerful message to leave on because this this thing within our communities that we don't support each other, that we don't empower each other, that needs to stop. And I think we need more sort of like minded, open minded, because to be fair, that's what true Islam is. It's supposed to be kind. It's supposed to be encouraging. We're supposed to be positive people. So I think we should definitely love one another more and, you know, look out for each other. And I think that's 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 exactly what I take away from speaking to you. So it's, uh -huh. it's been absolutely amazing speaking to you. And Alhamdulillah, for you know this opportunity to uh, connect and inshallah we look forward to part two with you for sure you're definitely <laughs> we've got to get you back because um you know you, you've been a powerful personality to have so thank you so much guys thank you for tuning in uh i hope you 
enjoyed today's episode, you'll be able to catch it on all our social media platforms on World Hijab Day. Do go subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. I want to say a big thank you once again to everybody who supports. Um, and from me, God bless and take care. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.